Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today for the third, third episode of our Connected Estuary webinar series. My name is Kristen, and I'm the coordinator for Rancos Lower Fraser Salmon Conservation Program, and I've been the host of this webinar series. So as always, before we get started, I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement. I live and I'm calling in from the unceded territory of the Squamish Nation and people who have lived here since time immemorial. Um, and as in previous episodes, for those of you who are calling in today, please feel free to introduce yourselves and where you're calling in from in the chat box provided. It helps us feel more connected over this virtual space. So for today's episode, we are going to discuss how the health of southern resident killer whales is directly associated with the health of Fraser River Chinook salmon populations. So in this uh, webinar, we'll explore what healthy estuary habitats mean for Chinook salmon and the recovery of southern resident killer whales. So a, a core theme of today's episode will be the trans the transboundary nature of these two species um, and why they're so important to both the U.S. and Canada. So for our U.S. friends who are watching, Chinook salmon are often referred to as king salmon in the U.S. So just a quick housekeeping note uh, to clarify before so we don't have any confusion about what species we're talking about. So in the previous episodes of this webinar, I've provided a overview of Raincoast Lower Fraser Salmon Conservation Program, which this webinar series is a part of. And today, since we're fortunate enough to have a member of our wild salmon team as a guest, I'm going to provide a quick overview of our wild salmon program, which just has a slightly different scope and focus from our Lower Fraser Salmon Conservation Program. So Raincoast Wild Salmon Program is focused on ensuring that British Columbia's um, over 450 unique and irreplaceable populations of salmon, which are also known as conservation units, um, persist over their historic ranges at spawner abundance levels, really suitable to meet the needs of wildlife and ecosystems. So these conservation units consist of thousands of spawning populations across hundreds of coastal rivers and watersheds on the BC coast. So while our wild salmon program has that coast-wide scope, today we're gonna to be focusing on Fraser River Chinook. Um, and our two guests today will be talking in depth about what science can tell us about the importance of the Fraser estuary to Chinook salmon, the interwoven relationship between Fraser Chinook and Southern resident killer whales, uh, the threats facing these two species, and we'll end the episode with some of the next steps that we can take to put these species on the path towards recovery. So I'm really excited to welcome two super inspiring researchers who are conducting both cutting edge scientific research, as well as working with all sectors of society to address some of the challenges facing Chinook salmon and Southern resident killer whales today. So with that being said, I would like to welcome my colleague here at Raincoast, Misty McDuffie. Misty is a biologist for Raincoast and our Wild Salmon Program Director. She has a particular interest in the role of salmon as a critical food source for wildlife and focuses on incorporating their needs into salmon management decisions. So welcome, Misty. Great to be here. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks for having us. I mean... Thanks for, we're, we're great, we're happy <laughs> Glad to get it out. Um, our second guest is Dr. Deborah Giles. And there's Giles. Giles uh, goes by her last name and she received her PhD from the University of California at Davis in 2014. Both her master's thesis and PhD um, focused on the federally listed Southern Resident Clay Oil. Uh, Giles now is a killer whale scientific advisor for the Orca Salmon Alliance, a program advisor for killer whale tails, and is on the steering committee for the Sailor Sea Ecosystem Advocates. Hi, Giles. Great to have you. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks, both of you, for joining us today. Um, so to open up our discussion, before we get into some of the questions about your research and work today, I'm wondering if um, you could describe how you became involved in researching Chinook salmon and southern resident killer whales. So really, what was your path to these species and their habitats? And Misty, maybe we'll start with you. Well, it wasn't a straight line. <laughs> it wove all over this coast 
And it started with being much more enamored with the furred and other finned and uh, feathered species than actually with salmon. And salmon was an evolution. And and so, sort of two things kind of came together. One, um, I was working um, on um, salmon restoration, habitat, sort of headwaters to deep waters approaches on the um, and the watersheds that drain into Saanich Inlet here in southern BC. But at the same time, I was also working um, for a natural history company on the um, in the Great Bear Rainforest in the 1990s in southeast Alaska. And no matter where I went on this coast, what and, and being so enamored with some of these bigger species, that it always came back to salmon. You know, like that was so many things were driven by these cycles of salmon and just to watch life unfold in some of those coastal watersheds really was sort of what, what started me down this track. And um, as you know, a lot of raincoast work originally started in the Great Bear Rainforest, but as in, in looking at the importance of salmon for wildlife, the obvious one was killer whales. And as um, southern, our, our work on southern residents started to deepen, beginning in the you know about 2010 with some of these lawsuits over critical habitat, and it, it evolved. And so then I, I used to sort of participate more on north coast, and then I ended up down here on the south coast. And then you know in 2015 or 15, we started carving out the Fraser Estuary Research program and it sort of has all unfolded the estuary program and our deepening into the importance of Chinook for Southern residents. So that's how I ended here. But now I'm really happy because I feel like I work in my backyard. Like mm -hmm. I feel that this is, um, the, I live in the Fraser estuary, sort of the broader Fraser, Fraser estuary. So I feel I'm, I'm working in my backyard. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for providing that. It's so, I, yeah, it's just so interesting hearing how people get into research in the conservation community. So thanks for that. Giles, would you like to explain how you arrived here? I'm um, sure. Mine took a long time also. Uh, I fell in love with Southern residents uh, early on when I was a teenager, got to see them for the first time in person when I was 18, on my 18th birthday from the San Juan County Park here on San Juan Island, Washington. Um, some girlfriends had planned a surprise birthday trip up from California so I could see them and we did. And we got to see them every day for eight days off the west side of San Juan, which is just not what we get to see anymore. Um, it took me a while to figure out how I was going to go to work for the Southern resident Killer Wells. Um, but I ended up finally, um, really it's it's a fun story but i got challenged by somebody at the whale museum to quit my job and uh, go to school and come back and do an internship with the whale museum which i did uh i was able to return his card and uh tell him that here i am 2005 i'm doing an internship with the sound watch boater education program and so that really started my actual career studying them uh for, with carrie koski um the the person that developed the sound watch Voter education program, which now there's a um, a sister group uh, called Straight Watch in uh, your part of the pond here. Um, so through that, I was able to meet all of the different researchers that were doing anything at all related to Southern residents and um, worked on my master's and PhD studying vessel effects mostly, but change in whale behavior uh, associated with geographic region and also uh, other things in the in the water with them like boats. So uh, 2009, I started working for uh, Dr. Wasser in the Center for Conservation Biology at the University of Washington, utilizing a scat detection dog on the front of the boat to help us sniff out killer whale feces. So that's where I am today. And one thing I do, I do want to mention is I'm, uh, the, I, and I might have spaced out, but I'm the science and research director for a nonprofit called Wild Orca as well. And our work uh, with that group is to really take the science and translate it in a way that is uh, accessible to the public and policymakers and really help people um, get in touch with what's happening and get engaged. And so we can talk about that more towards the end, I think. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks for that, Giles. What an 18th birthday that was. Wow. Yeah. Pretty amazing. And a challenge as well. And I'm, I'm glad that you fulfilled it. <laughs> um, great. So before we get into, yeah, more of the details about um, each of yours, your research that you've been involved with, I just kind of want to set the stage in terms of 
providing folks an idea of um, Chinook salmon, how the Fraser estuary is related to Chinook salmon, and then we'll kind of move into southern resident killer whales. So um, Misty, we'll start with you. I'm wondering if you can just give us kind of a, a broad overview of Chinook salmon and their life histories, and then we'll kind of go into some detail. Okay, for sure. And life history is always a good place to start when you're talking about Chinook and killer whales because it is this life history that has contributed to their reliance on, on Chinook. And when we say life history, we're ta just really talking about the different strategies that different Chinook have to how they're going to live their life. And like all salmon, they're anadromous. So they, they, they spawn and their eggs hatch in fresh water, but then they go to the ocean to um, live their life. But that's where Chinook take on all strategies of all the other species and, um, and they're one of the most diverse. So um, within, um, there's uh, sort of okay within that general plan of anadromy and and starting in in fresh water. Chinook can um, they can decide that they're going to live in fresh water for um, a few weeks, a few days, a few months, or even a year or more. And then then they can go to the ocean. And once they're in the ocean, they can decide, well, I'm going to live here for a couple of years, or I'm going to live here for three or four years. And, um, and then I'm going to come back. And when they come back, they can make decisions about, well, am I going to come back in the spring? Am I going to come back in the early summer, the fall, or in some cases, even the winter? And so we've got Chinook on the coast of North America that can be returning to watersheds every, every season and, and in some cases every month of the year. So they're, they're really diverse, but then um, we often break Chinook down into, um, uh, you, you hear the terms ocean type and stream type. And I'm just gonna share um, my screen to show you if I can um, uh, get this right. Uh, Boy, I don't know if this I'm gonna be able to do this fast enough. I should have. It's okay. I thought I had it up here, but um, So can we, uh, oh, did it work? No. Um, it's, there's multiple windows there. There it is. Okay, great. Uh, so, and here we've got a, um, a stream type, sorry, an ocean type Chinook. And in this case, this is one that would arrive in the Fraser estuary um, anytime from March through to, you know, we sort of see the end of them in June. And this is a Harrison type, or this is an ocean type Harrison Chinook. So these are the first ones to arrive um, in the estuary and they hatch and essentially make their way right down into the estuary. And you had Leah and Dave on in your last episode and they were really talking about the research that we've been doing over the last five years. And now we can say that, um, you know, these, these um, Harrison type Chinook will spend one to two months rearing in the estuary. They can spend up to three months there and they arrive as these tiny little um, fish that are, you know, somewhere around 30 millimeters long, and then they grow some, you know, around a half a millimeter a day for that time that they spend in the estuary, and then they um, they they undergo those physiological changes to adapt to seawater, and then they move on into their um, into the um, marine phase, and so that's the that ocean type fish is coming down to the estuary in their first year. And then we contrast this with the stream type Chinook. So the one on the right is a stream type arriving in the estuary, probably from the South Thompson, but we don't know yet. We haven't clipped his fin. Um, and this would have been a Chinook, a juvenile Chinook that would have spent 
a year rearing in fresh water in the upper parts of the Fraser. So that's sort of the, the two really distinct life history strategies in these fish that um, dictate, you know, how big they are and when they're going to go to, to the ocean. So the, the one on the right requires much less time rearing in, um, in the estuary than the one on the left. Great, thank you. Yeah, that was really helpful just to see the difference in, in size as well between those two strategies. It really helps um, grasp that concept. I'm wondering now, and you touched upon um, the research that uh, you and, and Leah and Dave, who are guests a couple of weeks ago, have done looking at the yeah, amount of time that different species of salmon have spent in the estuary, and it was important particularly for that Harrison population. And I'm wondering now if you could describe, I mentioned that some the theme of this webinar really is the transboundary nature of Chinook and Southern residents. I'm wondering if you could describe kind of the transboundary arc that Chinook takes Take after they leave the estuary. For sure. And so then it gets back into our life history strategies again. And uh, because these different types go just even from within the Fraser go different places in the um, in the ocean. And let me just see if I can. There, did that, does that come up? There we go. Uh, so, so if you're a Fraser Chinook and depending on this type of that type you are, so Harrison, um, the, the stream types, sorry, the ocean types come out um, from the lower Fraser. So they don't have very far to go between the lower Fraser and reaching the estuary. And then they, um, their strategy for living the life in the ocean is to stay generally on the continental shelf. So all of the red areas are where the, um, the Harrison ocean type Chinook rear in the marine environment. And then, um, and then um, when we're in the estuary, then come through sort of a, later in the spring, come the South Thompson ocean types. And their strategy for rearing is to, they can hang out on the shelf for some time, but then they'll also undertake a larger um, offshore migration. And you can see the, the roots on the shelf and then, um, and then the roots that they can take back on their return back to the Fraser. And then the third life history type and strategy is the stream types. And the stream types types come down from the upper Fraser. They spend very little time in the estuary and they're called um, offshore migrants. So they're heading straight out and then, and then coming back. So, um, and then as they funnel back, um, these types, some of them will migrate down through the, through Johnson Strait and around the top of Vancouver Island. The stream types generally move, um, through the Juan de Fuca and into the Fraser, but it's those, um, those migration routes into the Fraser, as into the Juan de Fuca, into Harrow Strait, up in through the around the Gulf Islands and then and then into the Fraser that where we also call critical habitat for southern resident killer whales as they're following the return migration of these fish. Great, thanks. That was really helpful. Um, so now that we've kind of set the stage in terms of Chinook salmon and their different life history strategies um, and their migration route and transboundary waters, I'm wondering, Giles, now if we could also do a similar um, just kind of overview with southern residents. So if you could describe uh, the different pods of the southern residents and also the distinction between um, southern and northern residents, as well as between transients. So kind of a three part question there. Oh, you're just on mute. Yeah, and I'm going to try and share my screen here. Sure. And I'm just uh, just sitting here kicking myself because there's an um, infographic that would have been really nice to share, but oh well. Uh, okay, so. Oh, yay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. So uh, I have to show uh, my dog, Eva, because she's perfect. Um, so she's our most uh, recent scat detection dog with the University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology and part of the Conservation Canines program. So uh, 
I, I just like putting this uh, slide in here because uh, we used to have bumper stickers that said everybody loves a pooping whale. Um, and I do hope to get some again someday soon. Um, but really, if you have a pooping whale, it means you have a whale that's eating. Um, and really, I should have a, a qualifier in here saying everybody loves a pooping whale that's pooping a lot of poop or something, but that's too much for a bumper sticker. But Scott can tell us so much about the whales. And so this is kind of the lens that I always see th things through. But taking a step back, uh, we really do have this shared history um, in the Salish Sea, both in Canada and, and U.S. waters, where there was a massive live capture uh, for, uh, for aquariums back in the late uh, early 60s through the mid 70s, um, with uh, perhaps as many as 58 southern resident killer whales removed from the wild to be put in concrete tanks or killed in the process. Um, and so when the uh, capture era ended, we just had 71 individuals. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, um, that they did recover after this for a bit of time, but the, the kind of the population dynamics was different back then. And they had a greater potential for recovery than they do right now. So um, can't, I can never give a talk without uh, giving a big shout out to Mike Big, the godfather of photo identification that's now used around the world on multiple different species from zebras to elephants, but uh, he's the one that really decided that, yeah, as, as a matter of fact, you could decide it and then prove that you could uh, take photos of these whales over time and tell them apart without having to mar them in any way. And so Mike Big started this work in Canada uh, in the kind of uh, early, uh, late 60s, early 70s, and then uh, Ken Balcom got involved um, in the early 70s, but really officially in 1976. So killer whales, uh, just very quickly, uh, there are probably at least 10 different ecotypes of killer whales around the world, uh, or sinus orca being the overall genus species, just like humans are all homo sapiens, all killer whales right now are considered or sinus orca. But really what we should be having is uh, possibly even based on genetics, uh, distinct populations with, with their own uh, genus, or not uh, genus, but species, but at least subspecies. Um, that's a big process and nobody's taken that on. But what we do recognize now are different ecotypes of killer whales. So in this region uh, of the world, we're lucky to have uh, the potential to encounter three of the 10 um, identified ecotypes, and that's the fish-eating killer whales like our southern residents, Mammal eating killer whales also now really being called Big's killer whales as a tip of the hat to Mike Big. And then very, very occasionally some offshore killer whales, which uh, we do now know eat some fish and can be seen in the vicinity of, uh, of our fish eating killer whales. But um, mostly these are shark eaters. And early studies really were showing that these whales could be identified by their life history and how they, how they make a living, how they forage. So who are the Southern residents? The Southern residents are a community of fish eating killer whales that are grouped together by their dialect. They are distinct from Northern resident killer whales uh, who occur, they do have a little bit of an overlapping territory right around Campbell River in the inland waters there between uh, mainland BC, Canada and Vancouver Island. But they really don't, they don't interact and inter intermingle at all with the Southern residents. Um, there are over 300 northern residents right now, and those guys are on a, a really healthy trajectory uh, going forward population-wise. Um, the southern residents are, uh, there are three pods in the, in the whole overall killer, southern resident killer whale clan or community, and those are J-pod, K-pod, and L-pod. And with the inclusion of the three most recent, uh, recently born calves, which we, we know the two J-pod calves are still with us, and we're crossing our fingers that the most recent uh, baby, which was born in uh, February of this year in L-pod, we're crossing our fingers for that little one as well. So that, uh, including those three, just bring us to a mere 75 individuals. So this map shows their range uh, in the, U, uh, in uh, this is, U.S. and Canada. So the uh, the green part is their overall uh, range. We do know that at least J-Pod has been seen in Southeast Alaska at least one time. Uh, uh, so they don't go up there too, too much because there's a lot of competition for other food up there. And uh, 
northern resident killer fish eating killer whales as well as southeast Alaskan uh, fish eating killer whales. So uh, southern residents tend to stay down here with J pod being the most resident of the three pods. And then L's and uh, K's dispersing in the winter time and going down as far as Monterey, California for L pod and uh, Point Reyes, California for K pod. So um, let's, let's quicken, quick in, uh, jumping in quickly. Um, I'm not sure if we're seeing the map. We still see Eva. Oh no. Yeah. Oh gosh, I've, I'm like six slides along. Okay. Well, at least you had something cute to look at. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I really don't know how to share it. I shared it. Let me stop sharing. Did I stop sharing? Yes, it did actually just switch um, to the DFO side. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, I'm really not sure what to do at this point. I'm gonna stay, say, you can see what's happening right now. We can see Michael, it might be your next slide that's the map. Yep, and then, okay, so, so that's Mike, see, Big, and Ken. Okay, so you don't see a killer whale slide. The, we see the ID shots, but not the, not you, you were referring to a map. Do you see this map? Nope, not yet. It looks like you're still clicked on slide four. That's very strange. Well, how about if we try this? There, that, now we're on slide, yeah, there there we go, that's it. There's the Southern Resident right. Low Range. Okay, thank you for interrupting me. Um, I'll just leave it in this view instead of trying to do it as slideshow view. Does that work for everybody? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so um, this shows their range. So currently designated critical habitat for the Southern residents is in yellow. And right now in our US federal government, we're still waiting for the designation for the outer coast uh, critical habitat, which is in green. And um, the Southern residents are uh, a matriarchal society where the females are the ones that essentially tell the pod where to go, when and when to go there. Um, this is especially important in times of low fish abundance. Um, this picture here, the, the two pictures on the right show L86, who's the new mom uh, for the calf that was born in February, that's L125. And that's a picture of that animal down there at the bottom. And then the picture on the, uh, the graph or the, uh, uh, Center for Wild Research photo ID page is on the left, and that shows you kind of how we map things out based on the female in that family. So I'll I'll try and hurry up here. I think we're running. Uh, we have a lot to cover still. Um, something that I do want to point out is that the southern residents are are just an incredibly unique population of animals. Alexandra Morton said it the best, and it was when I heard this, it was kind of like getting a, a sock in the gut that she was absolutely right when she said, if we lose uh, this population of animals, it will be the first time in history in which we have let a species go extinct in which we knew every single individual animal. And that's something really powerful to me to think about. We that are fortunate to get to study them know them as individuals. And um, part of it is their their obvious expression of culture through such behaviors as a greeting ceremony um, or kelping, where they purposely go out of their way to, to take kelp uh, spa, spa days, it seems like, just rolling around. And also things like sharing food, um, actively foraging with and to, you know together and um, sharing food. This picture up in the top uh, right-hand corner is a picture of J2, our oldest known uh, resident who passed away in 2016. This is one of the last photographs of her. And this is her showing, uh, it's showing her, it's hard to see in this image, but she's herding a fish towards her great grandson, J45, um, because J45's mom, J14, had died that year as well. And so these are, these are animals that have a rich history with each other and uh, in their environment. And these are animals that co-evolved eating massive, massive Chinook salmon. And, uh, um, you know, essentially being listed in Canada in 2001 and then later in 2005 in the United States, 
these identified threats are uh, are working synergistically in a negative way to impact these animals. But by far, the loss of of their prey base of these massive bodied long-lived Chinook salmon that they co-evolved with is by far the biggest problem uh, because that's exacerbating the other issues, the other threats that are facing these animals. And I think I'll stop right there because I, um, I think we're going to go on and um, kind of meld these two, which my next slides would go into. Okay, great. Yeah, maybe before that, um, we can go back to Misty and just ask how, um, as Giles just just mentioned, Southern residents just really evolved to eat large Chinook salmon. And I'm wondering if you could tell us, I mean, we know roughly that in Southern, an adult Southern resident needs up to 20 full ground or full body Chinook salmon per day. And I'm wondering if you could tell us how the size of Chinook um, salmon have changed over time. Yeah, this is a this is a really big and important issue, especially from the perspective of a of an animal that relies on the size and the abundance of of these fish. So, um, so sort of in two phases, you can we can see evidence from you know this from changes in in um, and there's two ways that we to describe that fish are getting smaller, and one is that. Um, that because of the population structure of these fish, so uh, they um, historically they you know these fish can live up until seven years of age, and generally the stream types are are the biggest and the oldest. They 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 live the longest, more so than the ocean types. And so you could have a you know a six year old or a seven year old Chinook salmon that is over you know, 45 kilograms, over a hundred pounds, over a meter in length, and that um, and that the size of those fish really influenced their ability to spawn in big, deep rivers. They were big fish that could move heavy gravels and they could bury their eggs below the scour force of the river. They had um, th their egg um, cavities could contain, you know, thousands of eggs. They're a large size. And so what has happened over time is that those, um, the age structure is changing. So we see very few um, the, of these really bigger, older fish. So the proportion of those fish has become smaller. And and it, and so that um, the size and the, both the size and the age are changing. So we say that the age at maturity is changing. So we're seeing salmon um, come back younger than they would normally have historically come back. And when they're younger, they're coming back at smaller sizes. And then we see smaller sizes within those within those age classes. So, you know, it um, as, as Giles was describing, it's not just a, a biological cal caloric dependence on these big old fish. They also have a social component to having these big old fish because so many of them were shared upon capture. And so since the start of the European fishery, that both the size at age and the age at maturity have been declining. And then in the last, you know, two decades or so, there's been another um, shift to, again, younger ages at maturity and smaller sizes. So if you're a Southern resident killer whale and, you know, your diet really is these what we call preferred, so they select heavily on these large old fish. So generally Chinook that are greater than 74 centimeters in length and more than four years of age. But now, um, those fish proportionally are making up a much smaller percentage of the Chinook that are out there. And this is a way to sort of characterize that, you know, some people say, well, there's lots of Chinook out there. Why, why are these killer whales not having enough to eat? And the, and the answer is because that's the proportion of their preferred prey that they select upon has become smaller and are sort of diminished in, in the abundance relative to all the other Chinook that are out there. And so it's a concern both if you're a killer whale and your preferred prey is not available at the abundance it was historically. It's also a concern from the from a productivity and a fecundity perspective of these fish because 
Um, smaller fish produce smaller eggs, a smaller number of eggs. They're not able to access the same areas of habitat. They're not able to bury their eggs into the river to avoid those heavy scour forces, especially as climate change is influencing these rivers more and more. So whether we're looking at this from the perspective of killer whales or whether we're looking at it from the perspective of the, the salmon themselves and their, their productivity and their health, that you know, there's there's concerns for the fact that this is occurring. Long-winded right. answer. Sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, and it was really helpful to paint that picture, and I think it leads perfectly back into what Giles was talking about. And Giles, some research um, that was recently published that Eba was was part of looked at um, the you collected scat and looked at the samples of scat and looked at different hormone profiles. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about that research and then how it ties into um, Fraser River Chinook salmon and, and the, and touches upon what Misty was talking about, just kind of like the, the, they're nutritionally stressed basically. It's, you're still on mute. <laughs> I thought I was going to get a handle on that after 2021 or 2020. <laughs> we all thought we did. Uh, so uh, things are changing so fast for these animals. These are animals that, that co-evolved with massive Pacific salmon over the millennia, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, they uh, evolved eating and finding, foraging for, and looking for those big bodied um, fatty, really fatty, rich Chinook salmon. Um, and so, yeah, I get that all of the time. Well, if these whales are so smart, why aren't they eating pink salmon? Um, well, they didn't, they didn't evolve to, to forage on pink. They can catch them. They catch them and play with them sometimes, but they don't really see them as food. Just like harbor porpoise and doll's porpoise, they catch them and play with them to death, but they don't see them as food. And, you know, you, one could ask, why don't they just switch prey? And it goes back to the culture of what they what they um, have learned over time and what they learned from their mom and what their mom learned from her mom. And so it, it, it is a challenging situation where uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that there's just not the abundance of salmon coming back into the the through the Strait of Juan de Fuca or over the top of Vancouver Island heading for the Washington rivers and the Fraser River. We just don't have those those abundant runs anymore. And so that's why we're really seeing a shift in the uh, habitat usage of this space for these whales. These whales would have come here, come mid-May uh, through uh, October in the past uh, and foraging on different runs of salmon coming into the inland waters. And that's just not the case anymore. It happens to be that we have a fair number of J-pod days uh, this year, more than more than in the past, but um, they are they are dispersed from L pod and K pod, and we have no idea how those those animals are faring. So when we talk about changes in fish abundance and fish quality, it's for the fish's sake, and it's also for all of the other animals that rely on these fish for their for their way of live for their life for their livelihood. And um, you know the way the play, where we fish, how we fish, when we fish. All of these things are having really detrimental impacts for uh, for the whales and for the fish. And this is feeding right into what Misty was just talking about with a large part of why we have the problems we have with, with the quality and quantity of fish at this point. And we're seeing it really vividly playing out, the, the, the bad impacts of those. We're seeing that play out in the... Um, you know, just the fact that the Southern residents are not recovering in the way that their Northern cousins are. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, it's so important to highlight that fact. And again, it ties really well into my next question, Misty, it um, kind of builds off of what we were just talking about, but your current work is, is looking at age overfishing of Chinook populations that occurs in coastal mixed stock interception fisheries. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can provide everyone just a quick idea of what those mixed stock interception fisheries are and then why is age overfishing problematic? And I think it, it ties in well into what we were just talking about and we can build off of it and how it, what it means for Southern residents. So one of the ways that the Chinook fishery is different from other salmon fisheries is that 
um, that the, well on on all of the salmon species, we have fisheries that occur on the migration routes of those of the fish. So in that, I showed that one figure of all the different strategies just for Chinook and where they go in the North Pacific and where they come back to the coast and then they migrate down the coast. Sometimes they go inside Vancouver Island, sometimes they go outside Vancouver Island. But they're often migrating not just as one population that's going to one river. There's often a large um, schools of fish that are migrating with many populations in there together. And that's that's what mixed stock means. Like today we would call, or I would call, the ecologists tend to call them population. The fisheries biologists tend to call them stocks. So it's, it's all these multiple populations and stocks that are traveling together. And so if you go fishing as they're traveling, you don't know who you're targeting. You're, it's, you could be catching an entire run of one um, population that's going to one area, or you could be getting little bits of, of, um, of fish from all kinds of different populations. So those are the mixed stock fisheries. And the interception nature is the fact that we're intercepting them on their way to their spawning grounds. So now um, in some places in the world that, that, that you know, uh, harvesting salmon on, on multiple populations just isn't done. They move their fisheries in the case of salmon close to terminal areas. So when they go fishing, it's on what we call known stocks. So if there was a fishery at the mouth of the Fraser, we at least know that all those fish are destined for the Fraser. So that's what a mixed stock interception fishery is. But the difference between Chinook fisheries and many of the other salmon species is that it's not just the migration routes that these fisheries are occurring on, it's the rearing grounds of immature Chinook salmon. So in that figure that I showed of the migration routes, all the red lines are the shelf rearers and all those places where they're rearing, growing to maturity or trying on the shelf is the places where the fisheries are occurring. So in, in, the, in the, what we call the, the PST, the Pacific Salmon Treaty Fisheries, that start up in Southeast Alaska and go until um, Southern British Columbia, uh, roughly the Pacific Salmon Commission estimates that roughly of all the age classes that they catch when they go fishing, everything from you know two-year-old fish to five and six-year-old fish, that 50% of them are not mature. So had those fisheries not occurred, those salmon would have stayed to um, live for another year, two years, three years, even four years in the ocean before they ret return. And when, when, um, when adult fish are returning to their rivers, they have a huge growth spurt in that last four months of growth in the ocean. It's it's unbelievable how much Chinook, like they can increase in, in weight by up to 50% in the four months prior to them entering the ocean. So what all this harvesting does is it has these size selective pressures that are influencing the age that fish mature and the and the um, and, and over time it's created this. It's not the only factor because now so many things may be influencing size at age and age of maturity. The um, the predators, the ocean, changing ocean conditions, all these things can be an influence on this um, effect that we're seeing. But but there is evidence from all over the world of the size selective pressures that harvest has. And so what we're looking at is if what if we didn't have those fisheries? What if they were terminal? What if what if there were no fisheries on the rearing grounds of Chinook salmon and all these fish were able to reach their um, their a their sorry their natal streams they would also have to pass through the feeding grounds of southern resident killer whales to get there so we would be if if we what are what the modeling that we're doing right now is um, that we're examining is that if we stopped these fisheries could we see a recovery in the proportion of large old fish again and so that's that's what we're examining and um, I mean, I can't because it's we're still in this process, but the results are very encouraging. And that if we were to do this, it could have ecological benefits for killer whales. It could have ecological be benefits for the population structure of these fish. And it could have social benefits and economic benefits because if the fish that are coming back are mature fish that are larger and older, then you need less of them to get the same weight and catch. 
And so, so by transitioning these fisheries, maybe not all of them, but most of them, so that it's a very small percentage of harvest that occurs on in the in the ocean, that it could have ecological, social, and economic benefits for for the ecosystem, for whales, and for people if we were to transition these fisheries. So that's that's what we're working on. Great, thanks for that. Yeah, it's so interesting, and I think it's really important to for our participants to understand just, you know, like the effects of our fisheries management at the moment and how we could move away from them and see the benefits to not only whales, but also humans and our economy. Um, I just want to remind our uh, folks who are viewing, we'll leave about uh, five to 10 minutes for participant questions. So if you do have questions for Misty or Giles, feel free to pop them in the comment box and we'll get to them in like five to seven minutes. But before we get there, Giles, um, I just wanted to ask you another uh, paper that you co-authored a few years ago looked at the um, social positioning among Southern residents in relation to mortality risk. And you found some really interesting results between males and females. And again, earlier you mentioned that um, Southern residents are a matriarchal society. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to what that research found in terms of uh, the mortality risk that males may experience uh, and depending on their social position within the pod versus females. Yeah, that was a really interesting paper led by uh, our colleagues at Exeter University in England. And that uh, showed that the females are preferentially foraging for their adult sons. Uh, so the bigger and older the son, the more likely he's going to be fed by mom, which seems a little counterintuitive considering these are uh, matriarchal societies where uh, the daughters and the offspring of these matriarchs would be in the family group. But the theory is, is that the females, that the daughters and the offspring, uh, the grand calves are getting the benefit of her deep knowledge about where to go and when to go there uh, based on, you know, what, what is out there in the environment. And um, so they're getting that benefit from her. And so then she's also getting the benefit of that because her genes are being passed on through her daughter and her daughter's offspring who stay with them for life. Um, but so so is her, uh, she's increasing her own likelihood of passing her genes on through her sons who also stay with her for his entire life because he'll go off ideally and mate with a female in another pod. And the responsibility of raising that calf is, is that of the, the mother and the grandmother. And so it's a, it's a pretty amazing, uh, uh, ingenious way of making kind of d hitting it on both sides where you're as a, as a grandmother, you're making sure that your genes are being well taken care of and, and have the best potential for long-term survival um, by, by going ahead and foraging for the sons. Now that's not to say that they don't, uh, that all members don't cooperatively hunt and share food with each other but it was looking like, uh, and it seems that it's still holding that that moms will forage for the sons. And so the, the sad part about that is, is that males whose mothers died in um, uh, a year are ten, uh, eight times as likely to die in the following year compared to males whose mothers have not died in that year. And so there is that really tight bond with them. And we've seen that with uh, even, honestly, even transient males who uh will have beached themselves after mom has beached and um so yeah it's pretty it's a pretty fantastic uh situation and then of course that has led to the development and the uh you know the evolution of menopause in killer whales as well where the females have a, a very very rich life long long life almost uh, as as much as when they're uh, able to to reproduce they live that extra long time afterwards in order to be there to help uh, the survival of the family. Wow, yeah, it's so amazing just hearing about their social structure and I think it helps us relate to them in, in their family unit. So it's really awesome to hear. Um, in the last few minutes here, I'm just wondering if each of you could describe, I mean, throughout this, this episode, we've talked a lot about um, the importance of, of Chinook salmon, particularly Fraser Chinook salmon, um, what declining abundance, but also change in size means for Southern residents. And I'm wondering if you could just quickly touch upon the other um, threats to Southern residents, and as well as some things that we could identify as solutions moving forward. 
So, Misty, maybe we'll just go back to you and, and just identify a few things. Well, one of the projects, so um, I guess Raincoast has a couple of strategies to recovery, both for Chinook and for killer whales. And one is, like when it comes to killer whales, that um, things can't get worse within their critical habitat, within their feeding area, if, if we're going to recover this population. So one is we've got to hold the line on any declining conditions within the Salish Sea. And that's from, you know, from, from a whale a critical habitat has... Um, it has food prey aspects, it's got acoustic aspects, and it's got water quality aspects. None of those things can get any worse. So we've got to hold the line. And then the second is threat reduction. We've got to actually reduce those three primary areas um, so they've got adequate prey, that the quality of that prey is sufficient, and that they have got an environment that isn't interfering with their successful foraging on that prey. So um, so those sort of two lines and uh, and then um, if I'm going to bring it back right to the Fraser Estuary, because there is a proposal that is um, in the works that affects both Chinook and killer whales. And that is the Roberts Bank Terminal 2 um, proposal to expand shipping, the shipping terminal. And so if people want to weigh in on, on stopping that project, they can go to our website and um, get information there on who to contact. And, and contacting ministers um, Wilkinson of um, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change and other um, ministers, both federally and provincially, that uh, need to be pressured. So that's one aspect. And then also it would be great if they want to um, write general letters to Fisheries and Oceans Canada talking about the importance of prey. And this is the one area, like, I mean, I, I give Canada credit on making progress in some areas on threat reduction, but they have not addressed the abundance of preferred Chinook salmon reaching critical habitat. And so that remains outstanding. The solution that they propose is hatcheries and other things, but they will not tackle the role that fisheries may play in um, in reducing abundance within critical habitat. Thanks for that. And yeah, it's great to have the Canadian context. Giles, I'm wondering if you could just provide the U.S. context in terms of threats and, and potential solutions. Uh, well, it's very similar uh, to what Misty just talked about. The, uh, for us uh, with Wild Orca, the most important thing for people, we're really asking people to get engaged with the Pacific Fisheries Management Council uh, process, which is uh, kind of uh, Cape Falcon, Oregon, um, up through BC, Canada. But uh, it's, it's a situation where we actually did just have an ad hoc work group that uh, came up with the uh, crazy notion that fisheries does not impact the Southern residents uh, enough to do much about it. And they've set a, a threshold that is not biologically significant, uh, I, we don't think for the recovery of the Southern residents. One thing to, to recognize is that the, the, while the management, fisheries management organizations uh, say that they take the, the needs of the whales into consideration, they do not consider them a major stakeholder. The whales don't have uh, an allocation of fish. All the fish that gets divided um, is amongst human fishers, uh, whether it be tribal or, or non-tribal. And uh, wild orca is in, in support of the tribe, tribes retaining their access to, to their uh, treaty right, you know, right, rightfully um, uh, owned salmon and, uh, and, but there are a lot of other fisheries that we could get handle on and that we could put some, uh, put some limits on right now until the whales, till the fish recover and until the whales recover more. Um, and I, I know that that's hard for people to, to stomach sometimes, but you know, we, we give subsidies in this country to a tremendous uh, amount of other industries in order to offset the negative impacts of, of their industries that may be failing. Uh, but, but if we're, if we're have a chance in hell to recover wild Chinook salmon, and I mean wild, not hybrids, uh, we need to be doing some pretty serious changes in the way that we're doing business. And again, it, it might not be um, palatable for some people, but ultimately if we make some changes, as Misty was suggesting, change the way, the place and the timing of where we're fishing, um, bring it back to a, a more traditional uh, fisheries like a, a terminal fisheries, 
um, that gives the opportunity to other mammals besides humans to have access to those fish. And it allows those fish to get big and get back to their natal spawning ground. And it certainly gives fisheries managers a better idea and uh, opportunity of uh, making sure that the, the wild stock is getting back to their natal river in, an, in enough abundance that those runs, those, those uh, wild genetics are preserved as much as possible. Great. Thank you so much for that. And yeah, we've had such a great conversation and I think it's been really helpful for people to kind of understand the full arc of, um, of you know, Chinook salmon leaving the Fraser estuary and their, their migration out through these transboundary waters and, and how their changing sizes over time has what that's meant for Southern residents and what we need to do to recover wild Chinook salmon and Southern residents. So in the, in these last few minutes here, we, we got a question from Shirley and I can just put it up on the screen here. She asked, do you feel your research is being well supported by the DFO and policymakers are paying attention to your research and learning? So um, maybe each of you can respond to that and, and Giles provide, you know, obviously the, the US equivalent, but um, yeah, Misty, we'll start with you. So um, I think that DFO has made some um, important and has, has undertaken some important initiatives to reduce threats on the whales. I don't think that they are adequately evaluating those threats and that they need to be supporting external research that has been proposed to evaluate the effectiveness of their threat reduction measures. So um, they tend to listen to their own work you know more than they they do and they support external work but um yeah so there can definitely be some improvements but uh yeah they're i mean they're 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 listening they're you know they do have larger collaborations but um it could be improved Um, you know, the, for me, the, it's a pie in the sky sort of um, hope, but it, it sure would be nice if our fisheries management was not under the Department of Commerce. Uh, I think that there's an inherent uh, conflict there when we've got endangered species, uh, multiple, multiple runs of endangered salmon uh, on the endangered species list for the sole purpose of growing more and killing them. Uh, we're not taking into consideration the needs of the ecosystems in which these salmon co-evolved, uh, let alone the, the other mammals, as I said, that rely on these fish for their way of life and for their very lively, their very lives. Um, I can't, I don't think that we can expect to see the Southern residents recover until we start thinking about these fish as um, less, as, less of a commodity for us to, to catch an important constituent part of the ecosystems in which they evolved. And I'd like to see our federal government do that. I do, again, I'm not gonna hold my breath because I like life and I think that'd kill me because uh, I don't think it's gonna happen. But that's that's the fact of the matter is, is that we've got conflicting mandates by this organization that is supposed to be recovering not only anadromous fish like salmon, but the, the whales themselves. Um, and all of that is under the Department of Commerce. Giles, that everything you said is completely applicable to fisheries and oceans. And I tried to say something nice within a very narrow scope of other threat reduction, but that conflicting mandate is, are they protecting fisheries or are they protecting fish? And that is the fundamental conflict within fisheries and oceans. And despite having a wild salmon policy, which recognizes the importance of diversity, of population structure, of range, of run timing, of all these things, it is still not implemented after 15 years. And there, and in our wild salmon policy, we really recognize the importance of considering ecosystems, considering wildlife, managing for these considerations, and and that none of that, none of that is happening. And now, just to make things things worse for the whole situation is that we are moving not not just not implementing it we are moving away from it to go down the road of what i would call us style fisheries management which means hatcheries you mark the fish and you create fisheries on marked fish and and you lose all of the objective to recover wild salmon on the landscape, getting wild fish back into their watersheds. And it is becoming increasingly focused and prioritized on maintaining hatchery fish 
largely for the recreational fishing community. And that, um, yeah, then that undermines everyone's efforts to recover wild Chinook and Southern resident killer whales. We don't even, in this country, and I know we're almost out of time, we, in this country, we're, we're moving away from the term wild fish even. We're not even calling them wild fish anymore. We're calling them natural fish, which is a hybrid of, of wild fish and, and hatchery fish, which is shifting the baseline to something that, you know, that's not what we should be aiming for. We should be aiming for the for the recovery of wild genetics. And we can't have that with, with just, you know, so much hatchery production kind of done willy nilly. I'm not opposed to all hatchery, but I'm opposed to hatcheries that are not done smartly. And uh, by shifting the baseline, by changing what we're calling wild fish is just a travesty. And very few people know that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. That was a great question, Shirley. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Shirley, for that question. And um, yeah, I think the, the conversation that we opened here could be a whole nother webinar. And unfortunately, we're out of time. But I want to thank both Misty and Giles for joining us today um, to discuss these really important topics around genetic salmon and southern residents. Um, we will have another uh, episode for our webinar series in two weeks, which will feature um, two guests talking about climate change and how that will impact the Fraser estuary. Um, and if you want to stay engaged in the discussion on these topics, please visit our website, raincoast.org or Wild Orca, and you can stay in touch with us. So thank you all so much for joining, and we will see you next time. Thanks, thank all. You. Thank you. Bye.